So the second story in my collection called Five Stories is a short story called Cop, Cop, Cop. And it was originally published in 2010 in a magazine called The First Line. And the unique thing about The First Line is that it is a magazine where um, they pick about, I don't know, 10 to 12 short stories every uh, three months to include in the magazine. And in each unique issue, there is a first line that is used in each of the stories. So they give the, f the first line of the, of the issue out um, a year in advance or so. And so writers have a chance to submit stories based on that first line. So the first line for Cop, 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 um, or the first line for that month of the First Line magazine was this line. 3,000 habitable planets in the world. Nah, not in the world. See, this is why I have to actually read it. 3,000 habitable planets in the known universe, and I'm stuck on the only one without a... And that was where they left it. There's an interesting... Um, conundrum that you run up into when you have to, first of all, use someone else's first line, which is how this um, magazine works. But in this particular case, the first line was very limiting. 3,000 habitable planets in the known universe. That kind of sets it up as a sci-fi story. Um, I suppose you could have used that first line and, and said something like 3,000 planets and then known universe and I happen to be on the only one with earthlings or something like that and, and based it um, you know in a in a less sci-fi way but that this particular first line sort of lends itself to more of a science fiction vibe then you'll notice the next line out after 3,000 planets in the universe and I'm stuck on the only one I'm that makes it a first person past tense narration so two major things about this story setting, um, which in my, in my mind is a big part of what sci makes science fiction science fiction is the setting, um, not just the physical setting, but the, the kind of um, rules of the, of the universe that a science fiction world has to have. Um, but also it gives us the point of view narration, the first person narrator. So, um, Taking the, this first line, I had to try to craft something. And of course, since they left it open at the end, we could decide, each writer could decide what their um, planet did not have any of. And, you know, I guess you could have done something like, you know, no water or no um, balloons or who knows. I mean, you could, you could have made anything, a world that had nothing, you know, didn't have some major component of our normal life. And I happened to be sitting at a coffee shop when I was contemplating <laughs> this story, and that was the obvious answer for me. But I started to write the story with just no coffee. I'm on a planet with no coffee. But that, did, that wasn't enough. I, I thought that wasn't absurd enough, and I, I really kind of felt like this lended itself to absurdity. So I decided that my story was going to be a planet without Starbucks. And in this world that I created, Starbucks had become, um, has become such a galactic force to be reckoned with that they have successfully embargoed this planet that this uh, narrator finds himself a part of. Um, he's been transferred there for work and he comes to find out that there's no Starbucks. And the reason there's no Starbucks is because the, um, the planet tried to undercut Starbucks and have their own, um, their own kind of small cafes, and Starbucks didn't like it. So there is a coffee embargo, and there's no coffee at all on this planet, but that's because um, there's no Starbucks. And Starbucks is the only coffee outlet in the galaxy, the universe, the... Um, the known the known universe so um, this narrator finds himself in that position and that's where the story takes off and where it gets a little absurd the 
the planet he finds himself on has a coffee substitute they call Cop Cop. And Cop Cop is um, a very poor substitute for coffee. And coffee connoisseurs who come to this planet do not enjoy uh, Cop Cop. And but it's the only it's the only game in town, so to speak, or at least that's what um, the official line is. And so the title of the story actually refers to a cop, 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 uh, a, an officer, a police officer who is assigned to um, enforce the embargo of coffee and make sure that coffee is um, not a part of of this world. And so this narrator finds himself. Um, in a black market situation, trying to get his hands on some actual coffee beans. And I could kind of imagine myself maybe maybe being in this guy's shoes, were I um, a galactic traveler transferred to a planet without any coffee. I thought this was a humorous story. It was, uh, it's one that when I go back and read now, I actually still laugh in a few places, and I think that's a good sign. I hope you enjoy it too. Uh, reading from the uh, short story, Cop, Cop, Cop. The story picks up um, a few days, a few weeks after um, our narrator has arrived on a world with no coffee. And he's being introduced to the local um, alternative to coffee, which is called Cop, Cop. He's being introduced by his co-workers and um, he's getting to know them a little bit and, and learn about the culture uh, surrounding this new world that he lives on. My new co-workers all take their break together and they invite me to join them. I'm hoping to get to know them better, especially the redhead who has the cubicle three spaces down from nine. Sometimes I hear her talking and her voice is so gentle and charming even when she's talking about errors in the mining data that I can't concentrate on my own work. They all have cop cop and the redhead sweet voice. No one has introduced us and no one name uses each other's names in this place pushes a cup over to me. I nurse it like a teetotaler at cocktail reception, tolerating a few sips while trying to hide my distaste. Not yet a fan redhead asks. Well, I say, thinking of a way to avoid insulting the local beverage of choice. It's all so new. I'm Erica, by the way, she says. My husband and I are going on a vineyard tour this weekend. We go every year just before harvest with a whole group of friends. You should come. I'm not sure why the hell this ride is so bumpy. The land of the vineyard is tabletop flat, and yet every few feet the trailer bumps us up into the air. Everyone squeals and laughs and makes funny faces and then laughs some more. With every bump, Erica holds her husband tighter and his hand finds another familiar curve on which to rest. It makes me sick. The bumping, I mean. When Erica said there would be a whole group, she didn't mention that they were all married. I'm the only non-paired person in this rickety trailer, being pulled by an antique, backfiring tractor through this barren, godforsaken wasteland. It's the most fun I've had on this planet. Cop cop plants are trellised, like grapes, except that they are only two feet tall. So I have to look over I have to look out over the side of the trailer to see them. Each bush supports clusters of tiny red pellets clinging to the vines. They remind me of the ceramic miniature grape pendants my mother used to make in the basement and sell at the local flea market. The trailer hits another bump and it pitches me forward so I almost fall over the side. Then we mercifully stop. Bob, the guy dragging our sorry asses all over this vineyard, cuts the engine, hops off the tractor, and joins us in the trailer. He sits on an overturned cop-cop crate and begins to talk as another vineyard worker passes out cups and napkins that the other riders, all veterans of this tour, tuck into their shirt collar. Bob says, This is our first stop, our Krinsky cop-cop, as you know, Krinsky is the oldest varietal, and these vines are all cultivated from direct cuttings from that very first cop-cop vine. 
Krinsky berries are often criticized for a flat one-dimensional taste, but if you taste carefully, I think you'll agree that the hints of citrus and the residue of honey in the finish are exquisite. The thermos of Krinsky Kop Kop comes around to me, and I can't refuse a sample. It tastes like peat moss with an aftertaste of mildew, but I slurp it and smile like everyone else. Erica looks at me and raises her cup in an across-the-trailer toast, which I return with a smile I hope doesn't betray my growing hatred for her and that pipsqueak she calls a husband. This pattern continues. We go to the Savoy section of the vineyard and I pretend to taste, quote, the mellow vanilla undertones. And in the Nobel section, I slap my lips together and nod when someone calls out, pomegranate? As Bob asks us which fruit we can taste in this variety, this continues field after field until we get the pro to the processing center. Bob pulls the tractor up to a loading dock that is built right next to train tracks. The train park there has 10 or 15 cars all filled with goats, neighing and mewing goats. Goats sticking white bearded heads out of the slats of train cars, staring at us with those dark eyes. In the field to our right, the goats are all pink and sluggish. They don't pay much attention to us. There are goat herders who are quietly urging the pink goats into a holding pen. What's with the goats, I ask? It seems like a reasonable question, but everybody laughs. You really are so adorable, Erica says. Her husband gives her a sideways look, but I realize she's saying it like she would to a toddler. Bob comes up and slaps me on the back. My shoulder stings, and if it wasn't bigger than me, if he wasn't bigger than me, and apparently much stronger, I'd consider punching him right in the stomach. My friends, Bob says, you didn't tell me we have a cop cop virgin on this tour. Bob goes on to tell me that the cop cop beans are actually coal black. The red covering that surrounds each bean is tough, like aged leather, and filled with a natural sedative. There are chemical processes, he says, to remove the red covering, but the chemicals are a disposal hazard, and the planet needs milk anyway, right? When it's clear I'm not getting it, Bob says, the goats have a natural stomach enzyme that breaks down the covering while sparing the cop cop bean. He pulls a handful of red colored beans from his left pocket. They go in looking like this, he says, and then he pulls a handful of black beans from his other pocket and they come out processed, like this, ready for us to collect them and roast them up. I throw up, barely missing Erica, but covering her husband's slippers. You can read the rest of Cop, Cop, Cop in my uh, story collection called Five Stories. Thanks.